Okay, so I did not know we had actual bomb factories in Tennessee. Like literal bomb factories. I thought that was just a cartoon job title. Can you imagine being on a first date and they're like, yeah, I work at a bomb factory. Sir, are you the red flag or the explosion? But jokes aside, one of those facilities, Accurate Energetic Systems, just exploded. 16 people didn't make it out. The blast was so powerful, it leveled the entire building. Building. And here's where things get dark. Authorities said there were no survivors found. And that's when every morbid neuron in my brain went, wait, if there were no survivors, what exactly did they find? Does anyone else's brain work like mine? Sorry, mom. Because people keep saying the victims were vaporized. But is that even scientifically possible? What happens to a human body when it's hit by a blast that intense? And because I can't not ask this, what do recovery teams actually look for when there's nothing left to recover? So tonight, we're talking about vaporization, DNA, and what happens when chemistry, physics, and human body collide at 3,000 degrees. Cue the intro! Cue the intro. Should I whisper it? ASMR. Death edition. I lost my spot. God. So let's get morbidly scientific for a second, because when a headline says someone was vaporized, I feel like Dr. Evil, vaporized, laser beams, because when a headline says someone was vaporized, most people picture a cartoon puff of smoke and a pair of shoes left behind. But as your friendly neighborhood mortician slash science teacher, I'm here to tell you that's not exactly how the human body works. In reality, to truly vaporize something organic, you need sustainable sustained heat hotter than 3,000 degrees Celsius, that's over 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit. For reference, quick mortuary fact, when we cremate someone, a regular everyday human body, we do it at about 1,600 to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to reduce an entire person to bone fragments and ash after two to three hours, but nowhere near enough to actually vaporize them. So when headlines say vaporized, we're talking about temperatures three three times higher than what we use to cremate the dead and happening in milliseconds, not hours. Basically, even cremation is a slow roast compared to what these explosions do. Hot take, literally. At 5,400 degrees, metals melt, concrete liquefies. So yeah, a human body made mostly of water, it's not evaporating into thin air, it's being ripped apart by pressure and heat all at the same time. So let's break it down. First, the shock wave. That's the big one. It hits faster than the speed of sound. Like being slammed by a wall of pressure so violent, your organs don't even have time to complain. Then the heat. So hot, it can flash boil water inside your body. Imagine every droplet of moisture instantly turning to steam. The pressure from that? Enough to tear tissue apart from the inside out. That's why investigators often find microscopic remains, bone dust, fragments smaller than grains of rice, not intact bodies. It's not that people vanish. Poof. It's that what's left is unrecognizable to the naked eye. Basically, it's a bad day to be made mostly of water. It's a bad joke. And for the record, so far, no human blast event in history has achieved complete vaporization of a human body. Not even Hiroshima. We'll get there. But first, Tennessee. October 10th, 2025. Accurate Energetic Systems, a 1,300-acre facility in rural Tennessee that manufactures military-grade explosives. A massive blast obliterated one of the buildings, flattening it completely. Officials confirmed 16 fatalities. The site was so destroyed that the sheriff said, there's nothing to describe. It's gone. No survivors found. No bodies recovered. But here's what we actually know. Investigators later identified 14 of the 16 victims through rapid DNA testing. That means there were remains, just not recognizable ones. We don't have any credible reports of intact body parts being found. Trust me, I looked. No visible limbs. No remains that could be visible visually identified. So when they say no survivors, it doesn't mean nothing left. It means what's left didn't look human anymore. 
So yeah, vaporized makes for a very dramatic headline, but the most accurate word here is obliterated. Reduced by heat, force, and chemistry to fragments too small to see. News reporters use vaporized because it sounds cinematic. Morbidly cinematic? Morticians use words like disintegration, thermal alteration, or complete fragmentation. Do you see why I don't get invited to dinner parties? Before we go any further, I just want to pause on one thing. Because as shocking as this is, the families of those 16 people in Tennessee are probably replaying this question in their heads right now. Did they feel it? The answer, as someone who studied what happens to the body in multiple different ways and in explosions, is no, they didn't. When a blast like this happens, it's faster than thought, faster than pain. We're talking fractions of a millisecond. Pressure, heat, and light all striking the body at once. The human nervous system doesn't even have time to send a signal before consciousness ends. So while the destruction is unimaginable, there's also mercy in the speed. One second they were there, working, talking, texting, existing, and the next they were gone. Instantly. No suffering, no awareness, and no fear. That doesn't make it easier for the people left behind, but sometimes the kindest truth I can offer is that death in moments like this is absolute and absolutely painless. <sighs> And that's something I hope families eventually get to hold on to, because the reality is they didn't feel a thing. And this isn't even the first time people have been declared vaporized. God, did they put that on death certificates? No. Somebody chime in in the comments if you've ever put vaporized on a death certificate. That would not be accurate. It's a term that's haunted history. Hiroshima, 9-11, and now Tennessee. But what does vaporization actually look like? Let's time travel back to 1945. If you Google vaporized humans, the first thing that will pop up is Hiroshima. Eyewitnesses said people near the blast center were instantly vaporized. And for decades, that phrase stuck. It's it's the reason we even use vaporized to describe destruction today. But here is the uncomfortable truth. Even at 3000 degrees Celsius, hotter than the surface of the sun, most bodies didn't vaporize. They carbonized. Skin and tissue were left flash burned. Internal organs boiled. And for people standing within about 500 feet of the hypocenter, the heat was so intense it left behind something even more haunting. The human shadows. If you can cut to some images of those morbid shadows. God, I'm at the air conditioner turned on. This is not a good time. Okay. okay, that's not a person's outline burned onto a wall like some grim graffiti. It's literally where a body blocked the thermal radiation, leaving a reverse silhouette. Everything around them bleached white from heat, and their shape preserved as a darker patch of stone. In a way, their last act on Earth was casting a shadow that never left. So yeah, vaporized isn't totally right. Their flesh was destroyed, their bones are often gone, but their presence presence still marked the world. Even at Hiroshima's heat, complete vaporization of a human body is physically impossible. What we saw instead was a split second of chemistry, a flash that turned people into shadow and dust. The body didn't disappear, it became part of the environment, part of the story, and honestly, that's kind of beautiful in literally the worst way possible. But then came a different kind of disappearance, not from heat, but from pulverization. Let's fast forward 56 years to September 11th, 2001. In New York City, after the towers collapsed, recovery workers faced a nightmare that looked a lot like vaporization. No intact human remains, no bodies, just dust. Over 2,700 people died in those towers, but investigators eventually collected tens of thousands of tiny human fragments. That's amazing, by the way. Some smaller than a fingernail, some invisible to the naked eye. They found bone particles embedded in the debris, on rooftops, blocks away, even in air vents. Each one was cataloged, tested, and added to what's now one of the largest DNA identification projects in human history. They even built a DNA lab beneath the memorial itself. I mean, that's pretty smart for convenience factor. A sacred scientific space where technicians still 
they'll work decades later to give names back to those fragments. So right now, when you think about how long 9-11 was, everybody remembers where they were if you were alive at that time. If you weren't a baby and you weren't born before 2001, there are people still working to identify the remains of 9-11 today. That's somebody's job. They show up every day and that's what they do. So when people said victims were vaporized, that wasn't true either. They were pulverized, scattered, and microscopic, but still there. The dust of human lives literally suspended in the air of lower Manhattan. And that's what we're probably seeing in Tennessee now. Not disappearances, disintegration, not vaporization, fragmentation. It's heartbreaking, but also kind of miraculous that even when the body is reduced to particles, DNA can still speak, even dust tells a story. And that's why I get frustrated when the word vaporized gets tossed around like popcorn. It sounds sensational, but it erases the incredible forensic work, the science, and honestly, the humanity in what happens next. So what happens when there's nothing left to bury of a body? When investigators say there's no remains, people imagine an empty coffin or a memorial with no name, maybe a picture up front, but that's it. But behind those headlines, are people doing some of the hardest work imaginable, the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team, or DMORT for short. Talked about them a few times. Always really interested in their line of work because these are the men and women that the government calls when tragedy hits on a massive scale. Plane crashes, hurricanes, 9-11, and now industrial blasts like this one. They're funeral directors, embalmers, forensic techs, dentists, DNA specialists, everyday professionals, professionals who step into chaos to bring order and dignity back to the dead. They work under FEMA and the National Disaster Medical System. And when local corners are overwhelmed, DMORT rolls in with refrigerated trucks, portable morgues, dental radiography units, and laptops loaded with victim identification software. Their job is to piece together what's left, even if what's left is microscopic. In Tennessee, recovery teams are following the same DMORT-style protocol call, stabilizing the scene, collecting fragments, cataloging everything for DNA. It's painstaking work. It's dangerous and it's emotional. So if anyone watching this actually is a part of DMORT, or maybe you know somebody that works for DMORT, first off, you're incredible. Can you tell them that? Because they really are. And second, I would love to interview you. Seriously, like hit me up because the world deserves to hear what you do. And I promise I'll ask the questions no one else is weird enough to ask, but I won't go too far. I just, I mean, I mean, maybe. Uh, but, but anyways, I, I, I just, I'm dying to talk to you. Respectfully weird, of course. I've sat across from families in similar moments and the families don't ask, where's the body? They'll typically ask, are you sure it's them? And because of teams like DMORT, that answer can finally be yes. Even when the body itself no longer exists in any recognizable form. That's the strange crossroads where I live. Grief meets chemistry. Mourning meets molecular biology. Even when you can't see someone anymore, their presence lingers in dust, in data, and in the devotion of the people who refuse to stop looking. And also, I'm a really big believer that after we die, we have the opportunity to follow our bodies around. I'm a spiritual person too. I love science. I'm also spiritual, 100%. Too many ghost stories. I should make another video about that so I can tell you guys more about my ghost encounters because we are all energy and it doesn't die when we do. It's still there. The word vaporized will always grab attention. It's cinematic, horrifying, and final. But people don't vanish. They transform. They fragment. They leave behind the smallest chemical fingerprints that say, I was here. When we throw around vaporized, we risk skipping over the science and the humanity of what really happens. Because even in total destruction, there's still evidence of life. <sighs> Even when there's no body to embalm, there's still a story worth telling. So yeah, maybe vaporized isn't the right word, but if it makes people stop and learn how recovery forensics and DMORN actually work, then I'm okay letting the headlines stay dramatic as long as the truth follows it. We love death facts over feelings here because science is hot, sometimes literally. I'm Lauren the Mortician, and if you enjoyed this little deep dive, and I swear I lost count of the amount of times I said 
been vaporized. If somebody wants to go back and count for me, vaporized, vaporization, vaporized, 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 vaporization. This has to be a record of the word vaporized being used in a video. It has to be. And anyways, you need a mango kiss before you go. This is Mango. She is my handy dandy morbid sidekick. She's normally sleeping beside me or on my lap when I tell you stories. And let me know what else you're dying to know or other topics you think I should cover below. I do read the comments and thank you for supporting me. Like, subscribe, easiest way to help keep me going. I love you guys. Love my coffin crew. Lick it up. Why do you smell like fish? Don't eat my hair. I need that. Can you eat this instead? Actually, I don't know what's more expensive.